Okay, and then two, the text as we have it. Um, I think it's pretty clear that Joseph Smith wrote at least some of the text as we have it. So as we've talked about, it's a modern uh, compilation. It's a 19th century text. It's dependent on the Bible, the King James Bible, but it also uh, includes a bunch of Joseph Smithisms. And so pretty famously, you know, we're aware that the Lehi's dream as a recorded in First Nephi chapter eight, um, parallels directly one of the many, um, actually the principal dream of Joseph Smith's vision. So Joseph Smith had dreams and I'm sorry, Joseph Smith Sr. Uh, that Lucy Smith recounts. And so those had been important in the Smith family and uh, essentially Lehi who's uh, showing up as essentially a alter ego of Joseph Smith Sr in the text also then has the same vision that Joseph Smith Sr. has. And so it's pretty hard to argue that that isn't coming from, that's that's coming from Solomon Spalding or something. In other words, it, I think everybody would agree that that's coming, uh, that that's Joseph Smith material as is, for example, in the second book of Nephi chapter three, when there's a long talk about uh, in the patriarchal blessing of the, of the uh, Joseph character in the Book of Mormon, where it's saying that Joseph of Egypt from uh, the book of Genesis foresaw a time when there would be in the latter days, essentially a choice seer who is also going to be named Joseph, the son of Joseph. So Joseph Jr. <laughs> so essentially the prediction of Joseph Smith himself, um, you would imagine that that's Joseph Smith <laughs> who's writing that as opposed to you know, Solomon Spalding or anything else. And then again, there's this in Second Nephi chapter 27, there's the um, a long story that predicts uh, the Martin Harris and, and Charles Anthon story. And so again, he's writing some of this book. So you would have to um, be aware that because of, um, you have to make this text again, like I say, this case literarily of why um, you, you think that someone else or there's some other big source here, whether it's Solomon Spaulding or some other conspiracy or whatever the component of it is, um, when in fact, it's very clear that well, some of this is coming from Joseph Smith since it's talking about him, right? Absolutely. Um, so, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, so I was just going to read that, this component with it has the, the Anthem story yeah. out of the Book yeah. of Mormon because I, I just always find this amazing. <laughs> so, let's see if I can. Yeah, when the, when the Bible predicts something, it, you, you think of like Isaiah, and a lamb shall come forth from the mountain and, or if you look at Revelations, you know, the beast with the eyes will, it's always these really predictions that are just very vague, right? Um, well, it, it's not like telling actual stories and naming names in, in very detailed ways. Yeah, in terms of anything that's in Isaiah that Christians read to predict Jesus, it's all or Revelations, amazingly right? Amazingly vague. Well, so some of Revelations, um, some of Revelations, for example, is predicting Nero and things like that because it's written after Nero. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> right. and so same thing. Some of the book of Daniel is predicting um, the, the particular activities of the Seleucid king Antiochus IV Epiphanes of Syria. And so it, it predicts it just spot on like nuts, crazy, until at a certain moment then it starts to really you know, go way off the mark and actually mispredict. And so what we can tell from that is that the book of Daniel was being written at the reign of Antiochus the Fourth Epiphanes, and it had just barely all those things that they it predicted so spot on in a kind of a crazy, literally perfect way, um, where you know was when it had had the book had been written, and then it's published or whatever, and then it's being done, being written, and then the new next things that happen, it, it predicted wrong because uh, at that point it's making like you say predictions that it does the author's not aware of, that are more vague, and then it actually in a lot of cases get disproved. So like, that's the kind of thing that is the way things work in the Bible. So if it's, a, if it's a prophecy where the prophecy is way ahead of time, it's been written in the ancient past, and then uh, people see fulfillment in Jesus or any other number of things, it's like you say, quite a vague thing that you have to kind of make Jesus to fit the prophecy. If it's something like um, it's perfect and spot on, it's a literary uh, prophecy that's being written after the fact, and that's true of the Book of Mormon as well. Right. So let's so, talk about this actual prediction. Yeah. And so this is a prediction. So, and it shall come to pass that the Lord God shall bring forth unto you the words of a book 
and they shall be the words of them which have slumbered. So uh, these are the words of the Nephites and Lamanites who have all uh, slumbered in their graves now, and now that God is going to bring forth that book, and behold, the book shall be sealed, and in the book shall be a revelation from God from the beginning of the world to the ending thereof, but the book shall be delivered unto a man, uh, and he shall deliver the words of the book, which are the words uh, of those uh, who have slumbered in the dust, and shall he, he shall deliver these words unto another. So it, so man gets it, and then he's going to give it to another person. But the words uh, which are shield, he shall not deliver, neither shall he deliver the book, for the book shall be sealed by the power of God, and the revelation which was sealed shall be kept in the book until the due time of the Lord, that they may come forth, and behold, they reveal all the things thereof, from the foundation of the world to the end thereof. So, you know, um, there's the sealed book and you aren't going to, even though when you get a hold of it, you aren't to give it to the other guy, <laughs> you know, so you're going to give him the, you know, the words, um, but anyway, he won't be able to be sealed. And then we, if we go like, uh, we remember the Martin Harris story, um, you know, Martin, Joseph said that Martin Harris told him that Charles Anthony had told him, I can't read a sealed book when he's presented with uh, a transcript similar to that character's transcript we had at the beginning of this uh, presentation. Right. So it's a and so, and then after that, though, after that whole Anthony incident, then the prophecy goes on, the day cometh that the words of the book, which were sealed, shall be read upon the housetops. And so everybody, the Book of Mormon will be published and it'll go everywhere. Uh, there, thereafter, wherefore, I'm sorry, wherefore at that day, when the book shall be delivered unto the man that I have spoken, of whom I have spoken, the book shall be hid from the eyes of the world, that the eyes of none shall behold it, save it be that three witnesses shall behold it by the power of God, besides him to whom the book shall be delivered, and they shall testify to the truth uh, uh, of the book and the things therein. So, you know, it's essentially... Um, this this prophecy, you know, I kind of mentioned at the uh, like uh, that version in the Book of Daniel. Um, this prophecy is written into the Book of Mormon after the Anthon incident has already happened, and so it is reflecting upon that. And then it's before they've decided that they're going to pick three witnesses, but then they are able to fulfill that prophecy themselves. And so the book itself is um, interacting with what they're doing. So. Like I'm saying is that this book, you know, the composition process in so many ways is unfolding right in front of us. And so having to have it be by somebody else is such a, a, a an unnecessary addition to this, um, <laughs> that, to this, this explanation that it, it's, it's crazy. So um, again, I um, recommend Dan Vogel's book, uh, Joseph Smith, the making of a prophet, which just in, in, almost too much detail <laughs> describes <laughs> <laughs> describes this whole process and how you can understand what was going on at the time and how the Book of Mormon here is directly, the text is directly interacting with what's happening at the time, including uh, the, the contemporary DNC sections that are being revealed and back and forth and what they're doing, you know, in the present, the idea that, um, uh, you know, the, the idea that, for example, uh, the Book of Mormon talks about reformed Egyptian, um, again, probably is something that is a reaction to what Anthon may have said if he said that the characters, um, when he saw them, maybe looked, some of them looked Egyptian, some of them looked Chaldean or whatever, you know, that they weren't all anything in particular, but he could say that one maybe looks like the Egyptian character of this or that. Uh, Harris got excited, he brought back that information, and then the book then includes that detail afterwards, you know? So, so again, um, anyway, it's pretty clearly being composed and influenced by the contemporary activities that we're aware of happening at the time of the composition process. Right. And, and, and I hope it's okay to bring out the kind of the Grant Palmer thesis here. You've covered a lot of it, but one of the, I think a really important book that that made a really worthwhile uh, attempt at explaining the text of the Book of Mormon, uh, you know, was the Grant Palmer book, An Insider's View of Mormon Origins, where he basically, you know, lists several key sources of inspiration, including the King James Bible, Joseph Smith's own biography, um, you know, sermons that were that were given, 
uh, you know, Protestant sermons in the burned over district that, that were given uh, throughout the time, the, the Masonic uh, legends and, and all the Masonic controversies that, that in Greg Palmer's view is sort of uh, played out in the discussion of the, um, the secret combinations and the, I don't know, the robber, what are they called? Robber? Baron, yeah, getting it, getting it, getting robbers, robbers and all yeah. that. Grant, you know, if you actually look at, um, oh, and of course the mound builder myth, uh, when you add all those things together, the New Testament mound builder myth, Joseph's own biography, uh, all the sermons that were being given, plus the, and the, the Masonic sort of uh, narratives, you, you kind of can find m- many of the major sources of the Book of Mormon, you know, right there in Joseph Smith's grasp. Is that Oh, yeah. Yeah. So all of those are showing, you know, again, that entirely rich 19th century context. The Book of Mormon is a product of its time. It, it speaks so directly to 1829 that it's very hard <laughs> to imagine a book that is more wedded to its exact moment of composition than the Book of Mormon. Um, I just am, 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 I'm identifying this particular point here that we're talking about um, because of um, how it, there could have been any number of people that were aware of those Protestant sermons or th- something like that in the year 1829. I'm just showing here how this is specifically Joseph Smith material. So the text itself is narrating events that happened to Joseph Smith and his contemporaries. But yeah, absolutely. Right. Great, important okay. work. All right. So your conclusion up to this point is what regarding no, the author? No alternate author is necessary at all. So with the, trying to come up with, you know, a Solomon Spaulding hypothetical lost text or whatever adds absolutely no explanatory power at all to our understanding of other texts. So given the fact that Joseph Smith continued to compose text that is Book of Mormon-like and uh, in a manner of how he did uh, compose the Book of Mormon, he stopped using the hat and the stone, but in any event is still uh, orally composing uh, revelatory text, inspired text. Um, so the fact that he comple- clearly has composed some of the text, so it's referencing him, it's uh, referring to things that he knows and does, uh, there isn't any need to imagine that he's uh, editing this lost uh, hypothetical manuscript. It just is an additional, I mean, it's our basic principle of parsimony. Uh, if you have to, you have to add this thing that you, there's no pr- clear footprints to in any way, and, and then when you add it, then you suddenly have to add in um, uh, the idea that Brigden had purloined the manuscript, and then you had all these other conspirators, and it, and it just it has no explanatory power, and in fact, actually, um, is way less likely to have happened because of all that. So. You're basically taking Occam's razor to the Solomon Spalding or Sidney Rigdon kind of theories. Yes. Yeah. All right. So we've uh, we've addressed. Uh, you know, whether the whole book is as impressive as apologists and general authorities like to make us think it is. And you've addressed whether a young man of Joseph's intellect and background could uh, author the book. What does right. that leave us? Well, so then that the last part of the equation is the, the time frame that we have in which to compose the text. Which is, you know, what, 30 days? What's the straw man? <laughs> well, well, look at it, right? So how, how, how much time did it take to compose? And so that's, um, we'll go ahead and look at it. So it's often argued um, that the present text, that the bulk of the present text um, is composed after Oliver Cowdery arrives in Harmony, which is around April 5th, 1829, and then completed, uh, let's say, by the end of June of that year. So that... Um, I've, I've different different people give different time frames. I think it's um, maybe Jack Welch said 85 days here, so I just use that number. So depending on what you're doing, that kind of time frame of maybe you've only got 85 days or less to compose the text. Calendar yeah. days, right? I just use that. Calendar days. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to talk about the time way this text is composed. So it's dictated, which I'm I'm suggesting here it's composed being composed orally which is completely alien to us right now, but because we primarily um, 
I mean, the way I made all these slides, I used a word processor. <laughs> um, and so one of the things that happens when you have a word processor is you go back and you, um, you know, you delete things and go back and they're always continuously changing. And also a word processor especially allows you to move the order of paragraphs and slides. And so I made some of these slides and then I went back and changed it and that kind of thing. And often um, if you are writing a, let's say a whole long book, instead of a slide presentation like this, you might have a, um, you might just make a written outline. That's a very normal thing for how we compose text where we, we use paper again in order to, um, um, we don't, instead of mentally composing it, we actually compose our thoughts using those kind of tools, word processing and paper. But in the past, um, actually oral composition was the norm. So obviously word processing was not the norm until, you know, in the eighties, you know, when it started to become uh, possible. Um, even if, even when I was in school, they um, research writing was taught by using note cards. I don't know if you remember that, if you had to do that. <laughs> note cards. And so anyway, that was still how we were ordering things using, you know, because paper had become cheap, but we didn't have word processors. But if you can imagine, if you remember back to like, um, I don't know, the kind of old movies that are you know, Hollywood classics, and they'll say, Miss Jenkins, come in here, I have to dictate a letter. <laughs> you know, and, they say, and he says, uh, to the president of the general you know, of Dynamics Corporation, and, the, and, and then he'll go ahead and just compose in a whole letter, and he isn't sitting around with some kind of a, uh, he has, it's not just babbling, and he's not, um, he isn't consulting a written outline. He's w pacing back and forth, looking up, and he's um, writing a, let's say, a logical, uh, uh, coherent essay about why he wants to talk to this particular person, right? And so that's how, um, the, that's why they had dictaphones. That's why that was an important invention because it was recording uh, a person's capacity to uh, compose text orally, right? Right. And in the 19th century, you know, we've talked about um, um, Grant Palmer uh, recording or showing us some of these sources of, of sermons by 19th century preachers. Some of those were composed ahead of time, and so we actually have them. Um, uh, a lot of them, like for example, uh, the King Follett discourse, the way we have it is because lots of people were trying to take it down at the time, and they've gone through all of the different um, scribes who were listening to it preached, and they've put, to, put it, assembled it together so that we could reconstruct what the text would have been. Um, but it was very much the norm in these revivals like Joseph Smith uh, describes as being influential to him, the Palmyra revival where um, uh, revival preachers would just give, go ahead and give sermons for hours and they would do that without a pre-prepared thing, without notes, uh, because oral composition is how was quite the norm. They were able to expound for a bunch of hours like that. It was completely possible um, uh, contemporaries uh, uh, black freedmen preachers who maybe weren't literate, actually weren't literate, would um, still be able to uh, um, compose sermons orally like that um, and give long oral performances. And it's not just babbling or something like that. Uh, it is actually um, a process of how people organize thoughts uh, without notes. And you've also mentioned um, the example, and I, I also recounted with my great grandfather, the example of oral storytelling uh, as a major form of entertainment about how people uh, just routinely um, told uh, tall tales, uh, nighttime around the fire and things like that as a major form of entertainment. And it was a skill that people had and people honed. So, so this is how um, I'm arguing this text is composed. So the Book of Mormon has all kinds of different ways that show that it's essentially, uh, there are signs that it's an oral composition as opposed to notes. Um, and certainly described that way because uh, Joseph Smith is described as speaking and then the scribes uh, end, up, end up writing it. Um, there's all kinds of different places where it'll, where it'll say things like, um, I don't know, but I was talking about this and, and it'll you know, kind of go back to, you know, back up to where uh, a tangent had been um, that show kind of a person uh, speaking uh, as opposed to a written style composition. All right. Okay. <clears throat> so if we go then thinking about that oral composition and we take that length, so we said that the text was a little over 270,000 
where it's long. We said that there's 85 days to do the bulk of it. So we don't even worry about like any amount of it that was written before Oliver Cowdery showed up or anything like that. Let's just take it. This isn't even bothering taking out the Isaiah quotes. Let's just take the whole thing, you know, and all that kind of thing. Not, not even counting. Just and all the, and Isaiah. all the, Sermon on the Mount stuff that's in Third Nephi, right? Right. So not even worrying about direct Bible quotes, not worrying about anything that was written. Let's just take and Joseph's own, Oliver again, Cowdery. Joseph's own biography, that sort of the Lehi's dream. Well, well, those he'd have to compose orally, right? I'm saying that the quotations you'd just be able to copy directly pretty fast, right? You can copy faster than you could right. than you could compose potentially. Anyway, so the um if we take that 85 days and you take the whole thing, what it means is that you have to compose a little over 3,200 words a day. And so that seems like an awful lot, but let's break that down. So if you were just speaking, like we're speaking right now, speakers talk, they spent, they usually, um, they speak between 7,500 and 9,000 words per hour. So obviously that you're talking way faster um, what we will have done at the end of this podcast is more than I, what I will have said at the end of this podcast is more than I will have had to uh, uh, compose for my Book of Mormon quota for the day, <laughs> you know, because this is lasting uh, longer than an hour. And so I will have probably, uh, however long this is going to be, I don't know. Anyway, I will have probably said, let's say 18,000 words at the end of this podcast. And so that will have gotten me through six days worth of, <laughs> you know, <laughs> what I have to do for my this quota, of this component of the Book of Mormon, right? Um, but, okay, that's just me talking. If you had to be sitting here writing, John, <laughs> instead of just recording and, and transmitting it across. So if you're having to use handwriting like Oliver Cowdery, um, down, right? yeah, I would have to talk a lot slower. And I would have more time to think about where I was going in terms of my composition. I'm working from notes. That's how, allow, allowing me to go a little faster. Although I, I wrote all these slides today. So it still counts in terms of how much, how my day works. <laughs> but anyway, the um, uh, legible handwriting, um, this is not for a trained scribe. This is for the average person, a person to adult to write uh, something out. I don't know. People are so much worse at writing now than they used to be. But anyway, um, apparently contem contemporarily um if you were going to write an hour it you can get about 1200 words legibly written at the end of the hour so that's kind of the limiting factor for how many words you can do an hour okay and so if we're doing that then um the pair together, so Smith and Cowdery with the Cowdery, top Cowdery writing speed, which is maybe six or seven times slower than Smith dictation speed, they would have to work around for that 85 days, they'd have to work around, if they were at the top speed that Cowdery can write, um, they would have to work for two hours and 40 minutes a day. However, given that they're engaged in this project full time, you know, they might have spent, let's say, a full eight hour day composing at a slower rate than that, right? So um, anyway, it's not, it's not um, super slow, but it's not, uh, you know, we're not having to require here to be a miracle to admit this to happen, right? Right. So the time frame is relatively brisk. Um, it doesn't, it's, it's doable by human beings. <laughs> you know, we're not having to sit around and, and say, well, maybe aliens wrote this or we have to, <laughs> we've proved here supernatural explanation. That's not, um, you know, that's not necessary for understanding this. And so therefore history doesn't require it. History of course, doesn't ever, anyway, isn't what, isn't about proving these kind of things. That's theology again. So Joseph Speed um, here when in terms of his composition so we you know oliver cowdery speed okay that's probably at the limit that he can type right anybody can write like that he doesn't have to be especially transcribed um joseph speed however is aided probably by the experience that he gained in uh 116 pages so he got experience telling that and then as you had already mentioned before you know he'd been contemplating this project for five years at least so all the way back to uh, when he reported the first Moroni visit in 1823. And so he's had a lot of time to think about, uh, about these stories and compose them in his head. And I'm going to read that quote that you have now from um, uh, Lucy Maxsmith. This is actually his mother. Um, 
his mother out of out of her out of the the notes. Um, so they've in uh, in Levina Fielding Anderson's book. There's the actual uh, transcript of the notes of this, as opposed to the heavily edited published versions of this. So she writes from uh, this time forth. So which is to say, right after she reports the Moroni vision, uh, Joseph continued to receive instructions from time to time and every evening we gathered our children together in the course of our evening conversations joseph would give us some of the most amusing recitals which could be imagined he would describe the ancient inhabitants of this continent their dress their manner of traveling the animals which they rode which by the way they didn't write animals but anyway the cities <laughs> but anyway as he understood it the cities that were built by them uh, the, the structure of their buildings with every particular of their mode of warfare, their religious worship, as particularly as though he had spent his life with them. The angel informed him at one time that he might make an effort to obtain the plates on the 22nd evening of the, I'm sorry, on the 22nd of the ensuing September. So like you were pointing out, this is before, um, before the actual uh, obtaining of the, of the, he said that he had obtained the physical artifact of the plates. Um, he is already uh, entertaining in nightly recitals the family with every particular of uh, Nephite and Lamanite culture. So, and, and people who are trying to be open and objective just have to be able to answer that question. How is it that before he ever receives the plates, uh, before, before he's ever gotten any direct you know, text or information about these civilizations, he's able to talk in detail about the structure of the buildings, the mode of warfare, the religious worship. Um, it makes no sense that he can, and, and to hold people captive for hours telling these details means that he must have this creative imagination and must have spent a lot, a lot of years you know, just like creating stories to entertain people around the fireplace. Yeah. Well, I mean, what it's specifically speaking to, I would say that this is not proving, um, this isn't proving, uh, because, because this source, this recollection comes after um, Joseph Smith's death, right? And so, and so, I mean, it could be, on, it could be, uh, in terms of trying to, since it's not before the Book of Mormon was published, it doesn't disprove anything about the Book of Mormon. But but it, what it actually does is that last part that you were saying. Uh, it it in as a recollection, it informs us a bunch of things about um, you know, given the fact that the book text is 19th century, that it is composed by Joseph Smith. It explains um, how he was able to do it rapidly. He's already thought of all these stories and all of these particulars. He's already honed his storytelling abilities. And so it is easy for him to, um, you know, he's speaking uh, at nightly recitals at a lot faster than Oliver Cowdery writing speed, right? <laughs> he's speaking, speaking at storytelling speed. And so as a result of that, the idea that, um, you know, at Oliver Cowdery writing speed in, you know, three hours, you know, three hours of work a day that you can, you can uh, get through this thing. I mean, it's just clearly very, very doable. Right. What about the possibility that he could have written notes or outlines or have, you know, spent time composing some of the book even before the starting date that you mentioned? I just don't think it's necessary to bother with paper outlines. Um, he, we, we, you have to, you need an outline, John, because you've been trained, you've, you've trained your brain to export um, things like lists and structure to paper so that you can, ha so that you, because you've been trained to do it that way. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I just think that uh, a person who is, uh, whose brain is trained for oral composition does not require those kind of notes in order to have um, thought up uh, these things and to have housed them logically in their brains and, and been able to then you know, pull from these kind of particulars and tell these stories you know, when called upon to do so. So I, 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 don't, I don't think it's necessary. So yeah, could he have done it? Sure. You know, all that, I mean, we, we, do, we, don't, we don't need to say so or not because we don't have those notes. And so until such a time as, as those scraps of paper or whatever were to somehow appear and they would be therefore uh, amazingly priceless artifacts, uh, um, that we don't need it as an explanation. It could, it could just have been in his head. Got it. So going back to the original formula. There we go. And we got it. So we have uh, 
why this is the historical consensus. So everybody who is not um, working, uh, let's say every historian who's not particularly working from an apologetic bent in order to try to prove their theology has all, all quite agrees here with the historical consensus. Joseph Smith composed the Book of Mormon. It's an entire book certainly, but in the end of the day, it's not a particularly impressive book that we can't imagine somebody like Joseph Smith writing. And in point of fact, it it has his fingerprints all over the whole thing, and it and it seems to be have composed uh, not only in the year that it was composed, but um, by the type of exact the type of person that Joseph Smith was, which is to say, a young man who uh, then goes on to dictate uh, many very similar works in very similar ways, and finally, as we've shown. Um, with the math, there was plenty of time for Joseph to compose the text, and so therefore, there's no reason for us to have recourse to extreme explanations. There we are. <laughs> Ryan writes, an eight-hour workday also allows for the scribes to read the text back and Joseph to edit as at least one person described the process. Thoughts on that, John Hamer? Sure, yeah. Um, so I'm not, I'm not saying one way or the other about you know how that goes. I mean, whether... However, the editing process works, you would have to look at the, um, unfortunately, we mostly have the printer's manuscript. You could look at the different scraps of the, of the composition text that we have and then try to, um, try to come up with that and, and, and decide how much editing there's been uh, in the original. Um, but yeah, it's not a, I don't think it's a, it's a hugely tough thing. Like I said, although people think that you have to have um, in this oral composition, the entire uh, cast of characters of the entire book and exactly what every one of the weights and measures are and what every city is. In fact, most of those are not called upon at any given time in the narrative. At any given point of the narrative, we're only moving forward with a small number of characters, a small number of places, and things like the, uh, the measure, units of measure and currency are totally forgotten and are made no use of. So uh, it's more or less a matter of simply telling simple stories with a small number of characters who then usually are spending most of their time either giving sermons that are all remarkably similar, uh, uh, essentially revival uh, second grade awakening sermons about how you need to um, understand that uh, you have to take upon you the name of Christ in order to be redeemed and all those kind of things. And then to um, a bunch of, you know, kind of warfare stories, especially that are quite closely modeled on, I don't know, Judges, the book of Judges. So anyway, there's not a, it's not, it's not so tough. <laughs> but yeah, you could, you could, you have, there's plenty of time to reread what you wrote. Um, Aaron asks, uh, what about having books open? We know the Bible was. Responses to that, John Hamer? Yeah, so I don't think there's any any problem to imagine that the Bible the Bible certainly is open when they're doing the Bible parts, and what I would suggest to that is I, I would think that that would seem to the people at the time. So when he's doing that initial, the descriptions that we have of him with the head in the hat and things like that, a lot of times we, that's during the slow part of the process with, when he's working with some of the early scribes like Martin Harris and things like that. We don't have descriptions of every last point of what's going on the entire time he's with Oliver Cowdery. We have way less descriptions from Oliver than we have with these earlier scribes. And so there's no reason particularly to think that um, that they have to have recourse to the hat or anything like that during much of this faster time period that he's working with Oliver Cowdery, um, clearly because of the literary dependence where the Bible is clearly open and being um, transferred directly in some components of the Book of Mormon, at some point or other, that text at least is open. But I would argue that that isn't necessarily viewed as cheating <laughs> uh, because that's also how um, these revival preachers are preaching their four hour long sermons. So one of the ways that they're doing that is that they have a passage of the Bible open and they'll read one little bit of it and then they'll expound on that, you know, for 20 minutes or something like that. Then they might go back and they might read a few more words of the Bible and then they'll go ahead and do that again. And so having the Bible open um, is only another uh, allowable, uh, authorized source of inspiration that would be, um, and in the minds I think of Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery, uh, you know, completely as licit as the inspiration of the plates up in the forest or whatever. In other words, the Bible is also from God. Now that works both ways, though, right? Because if it's true that he could have had other books open, I guess it's possible that he could have used the golden plates as part of the translation process. Is that fair to say? 
so if you if you're suggesting that there is an ancient source <laughs> you know uh you know and and the and the golden plates are that source then like i say we just that's part of that's the discipline of literary criticism so identify the part of the text that isn't 19th century that's actually ancient the ancient text that's embedded in the text it's it's very easy if somebody has taken a 2000 year old text and embedded it in a modern text uh a literary critic can tease that out, you know, usually. I mean, uh, the, it'll, it'll have seams that show the difference between the original author and the, and, the, and the contemporary author. So I haven't seen anybody do that. And the reason why you can't do that, I would argue, is because it doesn't exist. There is no ancient, ancient source. It's all a, a modern, except for the Bible, you know, uh, in terms of direct source. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, LDS Discussions writes... And I want to invite our, uh, our live listeners on Facebook to please post any questions you have to John Hamer right now, and we'll uh, include them at the end of this broadcast, because um, we love this interactiveness of our, our live listeners. Uh, LDS Discussions writes, this is what a lot of critics miss. It's actually quite easy to explain how Joseph did it without needing to focus on plagiarism, and in doing so also shows why a lot of Joseph's other mistakes come from his imagination slash understanding of the Bible, uh, parentheses, Book of Mormon, seeing Elias, Elijah, even though they're the same person, right. et cetera. Any response to that? Yeah, no, good point. I, I, I think that people, um, I didn't put it into my equation right at the front, um, but in the same exact way that, you know, you have uh, Joseph Smith, you know, the Book of Mormon, really tough to write, Joseph Smith, really bad, no time. And then we put in either conspiracy theory, God or aliens, you can also put on it plagiarism, all of these other sources and everything like that. They must be all of these other sources. But in fact, the book is quite composable as it is. And, and as the LDS discussions um, highlights here, um, this is one of the reasons why the book is replete with the kind of errors that it is. There's no reason why it can't have been composed, um, you know, without the recourse to all that. And for a really good treatment of anachronisms, both in the Bible and in the New Testament and in the Book of Mormon, please check out my David Bakavoy series. Uh, it's brilliant. And, and uh, he, he takes the understanding of anachronisms and textual criticism to a, a, a really deep level. It's great stuff. Um, Kristen Gluth Cranny writes, what about the relationship between Oliver Cowdery and Joseph Smith? Would you say it's probable that the two were connected and were contemplating producing the Book of Mormon together several years prior? According to Kathleen Melanakis, who we've had on Mormon Stories podcast, Joseph Smith Sr. and Oliver's father were members of the Wood Scrape group together. So Smith and Cowdery families were connected, question mark. Uh, what would be your response to Kristen Gluth Cranny? So yeah, there's a, it's a pretty small world there in Vermont. <laughs> um, there are all kinds of different connections that Oliver, I mean, I think they're even cousins to a certain extent. Um, uh, and, and also Oliver Cowdery is in the uh, congregation that Elias Smith was in, you know, the view of the Hebrews guy and everything, every, all this kind of thing. So there, and, and as we mentioned, um, uh, Hiram went to the school, the poor boy school associated with Dartmouth, who, uh, where that same curriculum was taught to Solomon Spalding, who also went to Dartmouth. There are, it's a tiny little world there and there's a lot of overlap. Um, I don't think that there's any reason though, that that means that we need to, um, uh, assert a, uh, a premeditated plan between Oliver and Joseph before that ha occurs any time before Oliver actually shows up. Uh, I don't. I don't think it's necessary. Again, we don't have any anything. We don't have any um, any text or anything historical way to show it. And since it's not necessary, and we don't have anything in the historical record to show it, I would. I would just say that there's no reason for us to even add something uh, that doesn't add anything. So uh, there, Oliver Cowdery. Um, can just as easily have uh, heard about this thing, thought it was super important and neat because of how excited uh, the Smith family were when they were talking about it, wanted to get a, go, go there, hear about it. He could have been immediately caught up with Joseph Smith's enthusiasm, which 
you know, everybody, lots of people were captivated by Joseph Smith and his charisma, his enthusiasm. There's no particular reason to think that Oliver Cowdery couldn't have been. And, uh, and it may well be for a young man just to seem like he's uh, gotten involved in something that was very meaningful and inspiring and important. And so I, I should think that that's probably the most likely scenario with him. And so then he's there um, as soon as he kind of gets comfortable with it and starts to think, mm, this is maybe first thinks this is really weird. I'm, how is this? He, he's, you know, got the hat thing going and to start out with and everything like that. And he's taking it down. And on the one hand, it's, it's sort of amazing, but he also has his doubts. But after time, he, he becomes um, maybe very convinced of the process and that, uh, that it's godly and of God and, and divine. And to the point where he, he also maybe also is, a slightly closer into how the sausages are being made. And he thinks that maybe he can uh, do the composition. And that's certainly, we have the, the stories about that, right? And so that's all in the historical record. And I think that that adequately describes um, what Oliver Cowdery's doing. So I don't think that we need to have had him um, have some kind of premeditated conspiracy of which we don't have any anything in the historical record that where they're talking about that, so. Um. Let's see. Kristen writes, I always learned that Oliver just magically shows up in Pennsylvania to be a scribe. So. Yeah, I think that it's that he, um, he showed up in, in Palmyra. And so he first talks to the Smith family, then they are talking to him about how excited they are and that they, and they, they also kind of see in him the potential that he could be a, a big help. And so I don't think it's, I don't know that it's magical, but anyway, it's a, um, what I would say with uh, opportunity is that, you know, people have this idea that opportunity only, you know, knocks once, <laughs> this kind of thing, but that opportunities are actually all around in front of all of us when we're open to them. And, uh, and so this is the kind of thing that Oliver Cowdery was open to, and it was certainly a, a need that had been around for Joseph Smith for a couple years. <laughs> he'd been sitting around trying to get somebody who was a decent scribe to write for him. And he'd, um, you know, at a certain point, cajoled his wife to do it only because she's the best one <laughs> he had to do. And wasn't that what that wasn't her first, her first love or concern or anything like that. And so suddenly he gets somebody who, you know, is really into it. And so then everything takes off and it goes very, very fast. They're able to uh, speed off um, and you know, get the whole ball rolling really fast. So I, and so is it magic? I don't know. I mean, it's a, it's some, it was a, it, whatever you want to say. <laughs> Got it. Okay. And then a, a couple other, uh, two similar questions. One from my good friend, Lindy Johnson. Hey, Lindy. She asks, what would you say to those who say, but the Book of Mormon has been proven to have many authors or literary styles. And then Ryan Janai Kurth writes, I learned in seminary that according to studies, different books of the Book of Mormon appear to be written by different authors. Is yeah. this true or fabricated? What would you say to Lindy and Ryan? So these are both, we, we had slides earlier about um, this computer analysis, this word printing. And so um, people have, for whatever reason, the Book of Mormon has attracted just nutso levels of computer analysis that is not done it's uh, uh for any any to any degree if you type in word printing in google the amount of responses that come up from book of mormon as opposed to anything else it's just this path because some early guys in byu did this in the 1980s it was already published in a farms book and i don't know i i, I as a kid i gave a talk on this when i was like 12 or something so which is that's like 1982 <laughs> you know so 1983 so this has been around for a while and so people have have been enamored with it and so i um um so i already so one of the things i said at the beginning of this is that prior to going anything down the line of of where a computer aided analysis is going to be helpful you first have to have the historical basis for it so i don't actually think that these studies um are valid or useful or add anything and they're all contradictory to each other they all have different explanations and what they largely prove i think is that you can program a computer to give whatever results that you want based on the parameters that you, you you kind of program into it. And and essentially the ex-Mormons come up with the one that show that uh, it's all written by one guy and that guy is Solomon Spalding or somebody like that. And the and then the Mormons write, you know, um, uh, come up with one that no, 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 it's all written by a thousand different, you know, whatever, 12 different people who have very distinct voices. I don't think, what I'd say is that we probably, 
uh, if to the extent that we get completely contradictory results like that, we probably don't have enough uh, text of any of the given author authors to uh, say anything meaningfully. What you can do in terms of literary analysis that doesn't um, that doesn't uh, waste your time with computers that isn't telling us anything, uh, but instead you look at, let's say, uh, voices and the fact that, for example, throughout the entire centuries of when the Book of Mormon uh, is occurring and all the different authors that are supposedly writing, and yet they never have any interest in women characters. <laughs> and so there's, no, so there's no women. So that, again, it seems to speak to one author. Um, people have noted, for example, that there's almost never any descriptive adjectives that use color, where we're not saying, you know, that he was wearing a blue, blue uh, cape <laughs> or something like that. It's just lacking. And it's maybe, it's an idiosyncrasy of, of, the, of this author who has a singular voice. You read the whole thing, it all sounds like it's written by the same guy, in my view. And so um, anyway, uh, computers aren't, aren't aiding past that at this point yet. So I would just, I would just ignore all of the computer studies. Um, they're not helpful at this point. <laughs> John William Uller uh, uh, writes, what about the most perfect book with the fullness of the gospel? From God to Joseph, no need to change anything that God revealed to Joseph. Many changes throughout history. What would you say to John? Well, yes, exactly. So yeah, we had the, we had the slide where we talked about the grammar errors and how there had been 4,000 corrections or so within Joseph Smith's lifetime from the first edition to later. So um, I don't know, this has been a, this has been an apologetic claim that goes all the way back that it's a, a you know, the most correct and perfect book, but it, um, I don't know, this is one of those things where you, <laughs> you complain too much, right? So you make a, you, uh, you make a, when something is clearly, it's like that, in that case, it's like the big lie theory. If you, um, you say something that's clearly not the case, then people, people believe you more when you say it. <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> that's something that's obviously not the case. So anyway, like you say, it's, that, it's not a reality-based claim, so. And the fact that it, it uh, you know, not to pile on, but just because we're at the end and we got the main stuff done, but, but for those who are new to this whole discussion, in case there's a few of you out there, when you add the fact that the Book of Mormon, number one, prohibits polygamy, uh, when later it was allowed, and then number two, the Book of Mormon, has a Trinitarian sort of conceptualization of, of the divine. In other words, God and Jesus are one, um, are united. Uh, and you consider the fact that none of the later doctrinal innovations that emerge from, you know, three degrees of glory to, uh, you know, exalted, you know, godhood and theosis to uh, temple work, baptism for the dead, uh, you know, the endowment, you know, there's so much, uh, and John Hammer, you can probably name other yep. later Nauvoo uh, innovations that are completely, a Melchizedek priesthood, right? That are completely absent from the Book of Mormon. You also have, and if you put it in the context of Joseph's own timeline, you have to wonder how convenient it is that it, it doesn't provide us with any other doctrinal information other than a few coming down on one side or another of a few of the debates that would be raging in the 1820s, it happens to address those issues, but fails to predict any of the later doctrinal innovations that come out through the Doctrine and Covenants, Pearl of Great Price, Book of Abraham, Nauvoo, et cetera. Is that, did I yeah, get that right? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So that's, I mean, just one of these, that's why I kind of have said like, the Book of Mormon is so much more completely embedded in its own time of exactly 1829 then you can that is almost imaginable but so yeah certainly that's also true in mormon doctrine so all of the core things that become so important to utah mormonism uh, all the late nauvoo theological developments everything like that like you just listed off um none of those are in the book of mormon but actually even more i mean even is just as stark or it, what is even more amazing is when i was talking about essentially how uh, the book of mormon itself during its composition process is actually tracking um, Joseph Smith's own life and the, where they're at in terms of the church so when they when they start in these um, in these sermons king benjamin's sermon and everything like that um, benjamin is essentially telling everybody um, 
that they have to become Christians and become saved, but he says nothing about getting baptized or having anything, and there's no sense of baptism at all. And this is at a time period when, in the Restoration, Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery, everybody, they haven't um, hadn't decided on a need for baptism. But it's only then when they decide that they need to get baptized, that's when Alma and the Waters of Mormon happen, and they have the um, a, a very... Uh, completely different idea of baptism than than later happens in the LDS Church. But anyway, you know. In the, but it, again, it's just tracking. Suddenly, that need for baptism uh, is in front of them, and then it occurs in the text, or it's happening at the same time. And so, and so, the, the text is is tracking with the developments of when it's being composed. Uh, but like you say, it does nothing to predict what all the developments are going to be in the next uh, fourteen years of Joseph Smith's life. So. And that's what the second half of Dan Vogel's book, uh, Joseph Smith and the Making of a Modern Prophet, it's just like, it takes the yeah. Book of Mormon authorship chapter by chapter, you know, book by yeah. book, right? Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. And it's like, he's, it's, I don't want to say tedious, but it's a, <laughs> very, well, is that, that's just an in-depth grind of an analysis that's, that's uh, you know, really solid, but uh, yeah, it's everything very technical. You want. It's everything you want, and then more, and then more, and then more and more and more. So it's way more than you wanted. <laughs> yeah, but he leaves. He doesn't leave a lot of stones unturned, right? Doesn't doesn't leave you wanting more. You want less. <laughs> so Richard Ains right Range writes. It's always puzzled me why believing Mormons have not questioned the fact that the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible differs in many places to the same passage recorded in the Book of Mormon. Both are claimed to have been the true original text, then surely they would have been the same. Thoughts on that, John Hamer? Yeah, it's weird, right? <laughs> so if you, were, if you had that, if you started from that, that idea or pretense or faith claim, and then you look at it, and so this is again something that you don't have to, uh, you don't have to be on uncorrelated material in order to see, just look at the Book of Mormon and just look at the JST and just see how they both treat Isaiah. And so in, in so doing, you would find out, oh, it actually are both idiosyncratically changing the King James version of Isaiah in similar and yet different ways. And so it, it so then you have to wonder why, why, like you say, why don't regular believing Mormons care about that? Um, you would think that that would be sufficient for anybody who's like, say, doing their own personal study uh, of, without using any uncorrelated material, they could come to that conclusion quite quickly. And again, not just Isaiah, but the New Testament as well, right? Yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, okay, Matthew writes, I've heard a lot about the significant Book of Mormon changes. For example, after the 1838 First Vision account was written, some Book of Mormon verses were changed to reflect moving away from the Trinitarian view to Jesus, Elohim and the Holy Ghost being three separate beings. How did the early saints react to these significant changes? Did anyone even notice how big those changes were? That's a good question. Yeah, I'm trying to think if there's um, major complaints about editing the Book of Mormon. I know um, probably David Whitmer uh, might complain about it. I know that of early members, David Whitmer is especially uh, vocal about his objection to changes and that just the much more massive um, re-edits to the uh, the personal revelations that are initially published uh, as the Book of Commandments. And then, you know, actually there, there's a manuscript, they're heavily edited, published as the Book of Commandments. Then, then from that publication, they're heavily edited and published as the Doctrine and Covenants. And so since those are so vastly changed that, um, you know, lots of early members like David Whitmer reacted quite negatively to that and, and published, you know, big diatribes against that. And so as a result, um, several of the Latter-day Saint tradition churches who look back to David Whitmer for that inspiration, for example, um, the Bicker Tonight, which is just to say the Church of Jesus Christ with headquarters in Monongahela, Pennsylvania, and also the Hedrickite tradition churches, the Temple Lot Church and the Associated Churches, um, all reject the Doctrine and Covenants as a standard work of scripture because of, uh, you know, essentially David Whitmer's testimony as, to, and they also have looked at it. Those are published, you know, Book of Commandments was published and the Doctrine and Covenants was published. So anybody, again, doing research on, on church published material could see just heavy edits that are, 
are not just grammar. They are changing theology. They are changing teachings. They're changing commandments. It was called a book of commandments. Now the commandments have been changed ex post facto. So it, it offended a lot of people. Yep. Um, and it's also, and again, if it were just the first vision story that we're changing, that would be problematic, you know, but maybe some might find it excusable. But when the Book of Mormon is being re-edited to change according to the changes that are also occurring as they rewrite the first vision story, that becomes doubly problematic, right? <laughs> well, well, they wouldn't have known about changes to the first vision story because they wouldn't have heard of it. No, I mean, for us now, looking Oh, back. yeah, for us. Yeah, for us now. Yep, yep. Yeah. Um, and it's probably worth mentioning that the Book of Mormon was not nearly emphasized as heavily in the 1830s or 40s as, as it was after Ezra Taft Benson beat us over the head with it, right? <laughs> yeah. So in that, in that regard, then, then in that sense, maybe the changes that occurred in the ed editing you know, wasn't as big a deal for people as the changes to the Doctrine and Covenants, because the Doctrine and Covenants was... Um, was also viewed as the law and constitution of the church. And so um, making those changes was important to church, you know, the actual operations and doctrine of the church. So, Right. Uh, so Kevin Lacey writes, I mean, they're all speaking fairly similarly, considering it's over a thousand freaking years. What's your response <laughs> to that? <laughs> like, is he, is he I, talking about the difference between sort of, uh, you know, old English, like, uh, in modern English, is that what he's talking about? Oh, maybe, but I, I just thought that the, he's, I, I guess I was interpreting it to be the authorial voices. So, I mean, in, in a sense, the Nephi, who's kind of like a, a proxy for Joseph Smith, and Moroni, who's like a proxy for Joseph Smith, they're quite similar to the way they speak and write and think, you know, and, the, and indeed the voice, you know, throughout um, Mormon's abridging voice and the and the underlying voices are all, you know, very, very similar. One of the things that's um, true in a person's, you know, first novel is that you tend to make it autobiographical. So you have all of the things about Le Lehi and his family and all that kind of thing. Uh, uh, brothers who are, who are uh, you know, you're feeling like you're being persecuted and those kind of things. And then you also have um, uh, simultaneously you tend to not have um, as sophisticated variation in characters because you're, anyway, it, it's your first time doesn't always happen. But anyway, in this case, it's all pretty um, one dimensional and, and wooden. And an apologist would say, oh, but, but Moroni abridged it all, or Mormon abridged it all. And so, sure. and so he, would, he would write it all out in a common kind of style. But then that's in, another in problem. Common, What's common that? Style that? A common style that's dependent on the King James Version of the Bible. So Mormon <laughs> wrote it after, you know, after 1800, you know, or whatever, after the late 1700s. And that's, again, a, a major problem is why is the Book of Mormon written in Old English, period? <laughs> It makes yeah. no sense uh, for it to be having these and thous in it. <laughs> well, it's just it's just how the, you know because of the King James time in that exact time period in 1820s, um, people you know people would maybe do in, the Quakers would do preaching in that you know that kind of these and thous and people would pray in that because they they read the Bible and it's sort of a Bible talk right and so that's that's why, but anyway, it has nothing to do, like you say, uh, the way you would do an actual translation. So any more than you would use kind of backwoods language, they was a coming up and to battle and all that kind of thing like the Book of Mormon has. Yeah. And just to, you know, for anyone who, just to reiterate a point I just made, if anybody's read Beowulf, you know, you can speak English now, but when you go back and read Beowulf, which was written a thousand, you know, plus years ago, you can't read it. You don't know what it means. <laughs> and, right. uh, Moroni, Mormon Moroni would have had those problems, right? Well, uh, because Mormon, because of the way language no in, evolves over time. There, there was no English when <laughs> when Mormon, No, 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 no. I mean, I mean, I mean, you know, Reformed Egyptian for a thousand years. How oh, would right, that right, have formed, yeah, right? Sure. Yeah. Well, I guess. Anyway, they're not as aware of. He's not as aware of the author is not aware of linguistic evolution, right? So. <laughs> But that's a, a, that's that's an important thing to yeah, consider. Yeah, yeah. yeah, there's that would be another thing. If we were if we hadn't already demonstrated without equivocation that the book is a 19th century text, there's all kinds of different ways that we could show that there's no possibility of that it's history. So Kevin just reminds us that the Book of Mormon doesn't mention the temple at all or any of the temple ordinances. I 
right. I referenced that, but he he just makes it much more succinct and clear. Kristen Cranny writes, nothing Mormon is in the Book of Mormon. What's your response to that, John Hammer? Well, this is why, you know, through the entire history of the reorganized church that there's, you know, the reorganized church was able to have um, a completely uh, Mormon Latter-day Saint tradition church that is upholding the Book of Mormon and, and being a very anti-polygamy, <laughs> uh, being Trinitarian and all those kind of things without... Um, you know, without any of the late Nauvoo stuff, because none of that late Nauvoo stuff is actually in the published scriptures, you know, except for when, you know, the later additions to the DNC that get published afterwards, like, for example, the, the polygamy revelation, which is not published until whatever, the 60s or 70s or whenever it is, long after the breakup of the church. So, <coughs> um, Ryan asks a question that only you could answer, John Hamer, as a Mormon scholar and as a Star Wars fan. Actually, <laughs> are you more of a Star Trek fan than a Star Wars fan? Yes. But anyway, I've, I have, I'm also aware of Star Wars. <laughs> so. I wonder if David Whitmer would not have liked George Lucas going back and editing Star Wars episodes four through six. <laughs> yeah, you would have, David Whitmer would have penned an address to all believers in the Star <laughs> Wars canon. You know, <laughs> he wrote it, like, stand right beside his address to all believers in the Book of Mormon. And, all, you know, anyway. By See, the I, way, most, I'm guessing most. Li- you know, Orthodox and definitely liberal progressive Mormons have no idea what that pamphlet is. Describe that really quickly, because it's a, it was a whopper to my testimony, honestly. Yeah. So um, late in life, uh, David Whitmer, who again is one of the three witnesses, who's a very important leader at, um, like at the at the end of Zion's camp. So this early military encampment, uh, Joseph Smith appoints him that he would be the his successor if at some time in the future Joseph Smith fell. And so he was uh, the first um, president of the church in Missouri as as uh, Joseph was president overall of the church and also in Kirtland. So he's a imp- very important early leader. He um, breaks with Joseph Smith in 1838 during the events that lead up to the Mormon-Missouri War and does not follow um, everybody to Nauvoo. Uh, and so just continues to live in, uh, in Missouri for the rest of his life where he's a, uh, respected small businessman, but he also, uh, ultimately reorganizes his own, uh, uh, restoration tradition church, um, called the church of Christ. So in other words, going back to that very early, um, Latter-day Saintism before the, even the word Latter-day Saint, he rejects that he rejects, uh, non, uh, non scriptural, uh, priesthood things like first presidency that doesn't exist in the the Bible, so he rejects it, and so he more or less says, "If you believe this testimony that I have in the Book of Mormon as a witness of the Book of Mormon, which I fervently um, do and I fervently test to it, then you also should believe my testimony about all of these changes, about all of these ways that um, the bulk of Latter Day Saints, all of you." stupid people in the RLDS church and in the LDS church who have gone astray from um, the true original principles that we all had together. And so he published a very, um, yeah, like you say, a, a, a series actually of, of very influential pamphlets um, that, you know, still get republished today for that reason. And you, you may have already mentioned this, but doesn't it basically say Joseph, Joseph created or made up things after the fact that weren't actually Oh yeah, you know, yeah. The like, way history happened when it actually unfolded, like the Melchizedek priesthood, right? Right. Yeah. So he he definitely confirms um, what the rest of the historical record shows, which is that there is no um, uh, there is no understanding of Melchizedek priesthood. This idea that if you go to Harmony and you see the kind of traditional spot now of the restoration of the Melchizedek priesthood, or you go to Salt Lake and see the statue of that on Temple Square, that that is a um, a story created after the fact to describe developments in priesthood that didn't happen until 1833. In beliefs about priesthood, <laughs> right? And beliefs about priesthood. Yeah. 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 And that's why we have no date conspicuously. We have no date. Right. For because the Melchizedek priesthood restoration. Cause it actually cause never it happened. Happen. It didn't happen. Right. And David Whitmer, one of the, if you, if you believe in David Whitmer's witness of the book of Mormon, then you have to ask why he's testifying also that, that there was no Melchizedek priesthood restoration. Right. Uh, yeah. that's, a, that's a problem. <laughs> yeah, and like I say, as a result of that, um, 
many of the churches accepted that testimony, including the Whitmerite Church, which has now gone extinct, but also the Bickertonite churches, the Bickertonite Church and the Hedrickite churches. And so those churches don't have, um, you know, these, uh, anyway, not, not necessarily Melchizedek priesthood, but they don't have uh, several of these offices that David Whitmer complains about, like First Presidency and things. All right. Well, John Hamer, we, we've uh, I think we've exhausted your amazing slides. Okay. <laughs> and it looks like we've exhausted the questions that our listeners have. So, I think we've done our duty for today. Well, wonderful. Thanks for having me for this one. This has been one I've wanted to do for a while, but I felt like we couldn't like. Uh, you know, until we'd put the pieces together of some of the context that we already did, we wouldn't, we weren't, couldn't, um, you know, hit all of these uh, major points that we had on this uh, session today. Uh, but I still got one more in me on the Book of Mormon that we I'll have to come back for, which we'll talk about. Um, anyway, what do we do with this thing now that we understand it as a 19th century book, for sure, and also Joseph Smith as its author. I love it. All right. So just to remind our listeners, please share this episode uh, on social media. For those of you who, who support the Open Stories Foundation and Mormon Stories podcast as donors, thank you. For those who enjoy this programming, but who, um, but who aren't supporters, we definitely need your financial support to keep the Open Stories Foundation uh, alive and to keep this content coming, whether it's paying for accountants or infrastructure, equipment, or the lease on our office space or uh, my compensation, whatever it is, we need your financial support. So please support. Uh, please also, uh, I don't know, do you want to give a plug for Community of Christ, John Hamer? You guys aren't really a missionary church, but do you want to give a plug anyway? Sure. Um, if you enjoy the kind of discussion that I'm having here every Tuesday um, at Toronto Center Place, I have discussions that are kind of wide ranging on all topics of history, theology, and philosophy. Uh, you can go to centerplace.ca our website and follow us on on facebook we do the lecture at 7 30 eastern every tuesday night uh the the last one that we did this week was who wrote the bible and the one we're doing next tuesday is uh an exploration of the Gnost, the lost gnostic gospels <laughs> so those are always they're always fun interesting topics and things like that and so you can go ahead and follow those and then if you uh, are in utah and in person for example well, there's a, a really great congregation of community of christ in salt lake and if you're looking around in general about it, um, you can go to ladder-dayseekers.org. Uh, and there's all kinds of uh, information about people who are Mormon or post-Mormon who are interested in finding out about Community of Christ. Love it. And then finally, if you like uh, this series, if, if you, you know, check out the, the Mormon Truth Claims Project, go to mormonstories.org slash truth or truth-claims. Uh, you'll find a bunch of really good essays on everything from the Book of Abraham to the Book of Mormon, several essays on the Book of Mormon, on jo masonry, on tithing, on, you know, kinderhook plates, uh, the temple, priesthood restoration. You'll find essays on all that stuff. Go read it. Give us feedback on it. Share it with others. Um, and as we go, we're going to keep refining these essays. We're going to make them better and better. We are going to record episodes, Mormon Stories podcast episodes, on um, on a good chunk of these topics. We appreciate that, and we uh, we are hoping to do a digital media campaign. Uh, looks like the billboard campaign is coming to a close at the end of kind of Marchish. Uh, we've loved the billboard; it's it's helped a lot of people. It's increased new visitors to our website by t between twenty and thirty percent. So we want to thank everyone who donated to the billboard campaign. If you want to see us do a digital marketing campaign where we advertise through um, either Google ads or Facebook, or if you want to sponsor a billboard in your local town, uh, you know, it's 5,800 bucks a month to do a billboard in Salt Lake City, but it may only be 600 bucks a month to do a billboard in Pocatello or Idaho Falls <clears throat> or Rexburg, or let's just say Mesa or Gilbert or Chandler or Tempe or St. George or Logan or, you know, Franklin or, you know, uh, you know, any heavily populated Mormon area. If you want to sponsor your own billboard, uh, please email us at mormonstories at gmail.com. We can get you the digital rendering. All you have to do is find a billboard company and uh, be willing to raise the donations from your local area uh, to pay for the billboard. But we would love to have more billboards 
uh, pop up all over the country uh, as people are interested in supporting that. But if you also want to support the digital marketing campaign, you can go to mormonstories.org slash billboard and donate. And we will use that money to fund ads through Google, ads through Facebook, uh, et cetera, so that we can spread the word about these essays that are great and the podcasts uh, that we're recording to correspond with the essays. So please support us if you can. Um, and please check us out soon on Mormon Stories for more episodes. All right, everyone. Thanks to our live listeners for their wonderful questions. And again, John Hamer, uh, somebody above wrote that you're a gift to us all. You're a modern miracle. Uh, <laughs> no, nah, people love you, John Hamer. So thank you so much for your willingness to share your gifts with us. Well, thank you so much for having me on. And thanks to everybody for uh, anyway, putting in the time to go through this all. And I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks again. All right, everyone. You guys take care. We'll see you again soon for another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. Take care. Thanks again, John. Bye-bye.